Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, powered by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's championship weekend in the National Football League, and then there were three meaningful football games left on the schedule. I am your host, Todd Furman, joined, as always, by my esteemed colleague and co-host, the one, the only, Pain Insider. But before we kick things off, I want to encourage all of you, our loyal listeners, if you haven't already done so this football season, not sure what you're waiting for, FanDuel.com, use the promo code BETTHEBOARD, take advantage of your $1,000 risk-free bets, plenty of great opportunities with single-game parlays, 30 to one enhanced odds. We know all of you fine folks in New York have already logged on and are using FanDuel at your leisure in the fine state of Louisiana. You guys are next on the docket, so I want to encourage everybody down there as well, just in time for championship weekend, to get FanDuel in the palm of their hands. And pain, I know it's a little bit bittersweet, my friend, but uh, as things wind down, we continue to stay white hot around these parts as it comes to best bets. Indeed took some work but we got there three games left man good action this weekend yeah yes we we do stay hot we do stay hot it was a i I was conflicted not gonna lie (laughs) not gonna lie on the fourth and 13 but i'm glad everyone (laughs) cashed along the way Oh, you take them when you can get them. I will say one thing, and uh, to our credit, you obviously have to evolve. Years ago, we probably what you'd say about eighty percent of our totals would have been unders. Now it's uh, becoming closer to a fifty-fifty split. Far from getting anywhere close. Uh, but when I watch games, because we're so conditioned to root for nothing to happen, I always have the worst case scenario mind and, and save your breath. It's not because I'm a pessimist, but when you look at the clock and you're watching on an over, you go so accustomed to watching that clock bleed going, all right, we're in good shape. You try and do the mental arithmetic overs for me are still a little bit of uncharted territory. And I'm trying to warm to them week by week. Yeah. They're a little bit more of a difficult proposition. There's no doubt about that. And even when you're sitting there, both teams scoring on their opening possession, seven, seven, I'm watching the game and saying, boy, the pace is very slow. The game is very methodical. It's requiring a lot of third down conversions and fourth down conversions. If that variance hits on those critical downs, suddenly we're probably not on the good side of this. And then you had three straight punts in the second quarter. I will say the live total never dipped below 50. And when you have two quarterbacks like that, you have two offenses like that, there's always some spurtability. And we just happen to see that spurtability in the final couple minutes of of the fourth quarter. Yeah, I'm not sure spurtability is a strong enough word given what we saw transpire uh, in the final 120 seconds of regulation. And obviously, we had the two touchdowns at the end of the first half as well. Harrison Budker would have preferred him making that field goal. You never want to leave points out there, but I think it does beg an interesting question. And obviously, it was a hot button topics from from you know football fans, sports betters, and those in and around the space. But I'm always curious to get your your take on it. I, of course, have strong sentiments. But when you look at the NFL overtime rule, there's no doubt that whoever won that coin toss was going to have a competitive advantage given what we'd seen from two defenses that were gassed. Fair or foul the way the NFL overtime works in the postseason compared to the regular season? Or do you think there have to be minor tweaks made going forward? We're not the hot take podcast. And I know at this point in the week, everyone's heard all the takes on radio and television. I'm in the minority here, okay? And certainly the team that gets it first in that situation, specific to that game, it's going to seem like there's a massive edge. But the reality is the way the new overtime rules are constructed, the team who gets the ball first, they need to score a touchdown, right? The team that doesn't get it first needs to stop in a field goal. So there's instances where no matter what format you're using, even the college level, right? When they went back and moved it to the 25-yard line, the team that wins the toss is at a huge advantage there as well because they get to see what the opponent does. Yep. I think it's a different ball game here, and I think the perception is different if we aren't prisoners of the moment, and I'm talking about the final five or six minutes if this is a game between Ray Lewis's Baltimore Ravens and the 85 Bears and we're going into overtime at 7-7, suddenly you're saying to yourself, 
I'm okay with maybe kicking this off, getting a stop, and then only needing a field goal. But it's only because we have how many ever points scored the final two minutes, and everyone's a prisoner of the moment in this new internet age, right, where we just want more, 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 whether it's content, whether it's sports, we just want more, right? 18 weeks, not enough. We're going to have 20 weeks in a, in a couple of years. It's never fucking enough. We're taking, okay. by the way, if the NFL does expand its regular season to 20 weeks, you and I are instituting multiple bye weeks to keep our sanity doing this podcast. Yes. I mean, it's just, listen, when I watch this game, when I look at this game, this is something we've been saying all season long. Your Buffalo Bills that had the number one defense metrically was not the number one defense. And when I remove myself from the final 13 seconds of this game and I watch it live, I watch the All-22, I watch the condensed three or four times since then, I came away saying we got the right side here. We got the right winner because throughout the course of that game, I'm sitting here watching Patrick Mahomes put on the greatest performance that I have seen in terms of difficulty. Josh Allen's fucking awesome. He's a franchise quarterback. He's awesome. He was great. But there's a difference between what Patrick Mahomes did surgically going five, six, seven, eight yards a clip every single drive and having to be perfect. He didn't attempt a ball over 20 yards in the air. He had to be precision-like. This isn't a defender falling on 4th and 13 where just about every competent quarterback in the NFL makes a throw when a guy's 20 yards wide open. This isn't Gabriel Davis scoring a touchdown over the middle of the field without Tyron Matthew and having no safeties that Spags is putting Legereus Snee to cover corner at safety. And he's splitting, and Gabriel Davis is split in the middle of it. Now, obviously, down nine, the throw to Gabriel Davis over Thornhill's head is a throw very few quarterbacks in the world can make and take nothing away from Josh Allen. He was fantastic without him. His ability to move, his ability to scramble. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is, is great, but in terms of like talent, when you look at the arm strength, when you look at the size, when you look at the mobility, talent-wise, Josh Allen probably is the best quarterback in the entire NFL talent-wise. But what we've seen from Patrick Mahomes not having a single turnover-worthy throw in the playoffs to this point and how he's surgically had to do it, unreal. And you think about that game, right? Tyreek Hill returns the punt. You're at 23-21. Chiefs, you're in that position despite Harrison Butker pissing away four points. And you're in that position, and and I don't want to get into this too far because – you know, we've seen Matt Nagy fizzle out with Chicago. This is very much a Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes thing. And this is why Eric Bieniemy hasn't been hired. And I can tell you firsthand, he's bombing interviews left and right. But also, if you were someone that was strongly considering Eric Bieniemy as your head coach, and at 23-21 with Josh Allen on the other side, you hand the fucking ball off three times to Jarek McKinnon, who you didn't think was good enough to play the first 17 weeks, and, and taking it out of Patrick Mahomes' hands, if you lost that game, not only are you unhirable, I'm firing you on Monday morning. And so when you look at the situations where that came into play, I kept saying we have the right winner here. I really didn't think of it I understand Bills fans are going to look at the last 13 seconds and be like, oh my God, we, we could have squib kicked it. We could have done X, Y, and Z. We've got, right, you're, you're up 26 21. It takes back to back fourth down conversions, fourth and four, fourth and 13, right? I mean, you're like 13% chance maybe to have that based on, you know, your defense being dog tired, guys being out, and it being Josh Allen. But like these aren't things that are sustainable long term. You got them in the moment. But again, I think we have the right winner overall. And I think what's concerning here is, I love Buffalo, okay? Bill's Mafia is awesome. It's a passionate fan base. No one knows this, but I was, you know, if it wasn't for Patrick Mahomes, there probably wasn't a team that I was rooting for more than, than Buffalo. And for reasons I won't divulge here. But, like, this is difficult, I think, as a Bills fan, because everyone that I've seen this week, Todd, just assuming they're going to be back next year. And what I am going to say is, the guys responsible for this offensive surge over the last couple of years probably are not going to be there. And I think that puts a lot on McDermott's plate to hiring the right guy. And immediately this week, 
in the postseason pressers, what is McDermott talking about? He's talking about running the ball more. He's talking about being physical. Like, shoot yourself in the face, okay? <laughs> That's not how you're beating Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes again. And so if you lose Brian Dayball, who I expect you to lose here in the next week, he's got his pick of the litter. And you're losing the minds behind Brian Dayball. It's going to be tough sledding. Yeah. So I don't think it's automatically being right back in the fold. And, you know, when you think about what they built up, right, like Josh Allen year one is a guy who doesn't quite have it between the ears, is working on mechanical things. And then, you know, year two, you start to add some weapons. And then year three, you know, his offseason, he's spent out on the West Coast and he's refining his mechanics. And now he's got... You know, they bring in Diggs, and Brian Dayball's now changed his system completely, and you fell short last year. And then this offseason was, you know, we're bringing in new defensive ends so we can rotate them like like a hockey lineup, and, you know, we can get after them pressure-wise, and you fell short again. So when you lose Brian Dayball, and Leslie Frazier's being interviewed as well. I don't know if he's ultimately going to get a job. Probably not. But you could be faced here in a couple of weeks where you're without both of your, your coordinators. Yeah, it's a tough situation. Do you realize how close you were for Bills fans? Obviously, they would have had a very favorable matchup against the Cincinnati Bengals. Of course, we'll get to Chiefs and Bengals in a few moments. Uh, But to take for granted that you're always going to be on the top of the mountain in a division that I think will get significantly better uh, over the next couple of years in the AFC East. I'm not saying Buffalo's window has closed by any stretch of the imagination, but to your point, Sean McDermott talking with an old school mentality when you have arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the league, the last thing you want to do is to buy a sports car so you can go driving around 25 miles an hour in a school zone to really get the maximum upside from that particular endeavor. When you look at the other three games... You should drive 25 miles per hour in a school zone no matter if you own a Ferrari or a Pinto. We are law-abiding citizens right. on this podcast, but I get your point. Well, I mean, yes. I'm out here in yes. Vegas, so Nate Hobbs... You should not be going 65 in the right lane with your Ferrari when... No, probably not the uh, best idea, nor should you be driving 200 miles an hour on the Beltway like Nate Hobbs, uh, who after one wake-up call with a DUI... After that situation, right? Yeah, exactly. Rugs didn't, rugs didn't learn from rugs. It's, it's incredible, but that's a completely different discussion for a different day. Uh, obviously, the Bills-Chiefs game was the most memorable of the weekend, but of course, we were treated to three outstanding games. It was the smallest margin of victory for four games in a NFL playoff weekend that we've ever seen in the history of the league. Any other things that really stood out to you um, one way or another? And you can focus on teams that have been eliminated or obviously the four that were still to break down on this show. You know, I I think it was, I hate to say this because you don't want to piss off fan bases, but there are two things just in general that we've seen towards the latter part of the season and then into the playoffs that, you know, when you do what we do on the the forward facing side, the public side, you would be amazed about the emails and the comments and the mentions we get. And the first one, just in general, like the Cardinals, everyone was calling Cliff Kingsbury coach of the year. Kyler was in the running for MVP. And like, we were just kind of pounding that table like I just I don't see it. I don't see it. So when you play one good game the final five or six weeks of the season and you get boat raced in the playoffs, there is some level of vindication there. Green Bay is a fantastic team. Very good football team. Were they 13 wins good? No. When you look at the Pythag, something said completely different. You understand that they're in a division where you get to beat up on some of the dregs of this league. The very best team within that division that you had to face other than obviously you being the head honcho is a team in the Vikings where the players hated its head coach so you didn't really face anybody in division and so seeing them get bounced to a team that we kept telling everyone was substantially better than their record and we kept getting shit about Kyle Shanahan really ain't that genius right it's good to get some vindication there and so that's what I enjoy seeing in terms of the Titans You got to win that game. You got to be better coached. And that's ultimately why they're not hosting a playoff game this weekend. Take nothing away from the Bengals. Great story. But that is a Tannehill. That is a Vrabel. That is a Todd Downing loss. 
Man, oh man. I mean, Titans fans have to be wondering, even more so than Bills fans, this was the team roster-wise that gave them all the opportunity to not only win that football game, but to host the AFC Championship and have a chance uh, to win that elusive Lombardi trophy. Now you're stuck with Ryan Tannehill. You know the kind of cap hit he's going to account for, and quarterback appears to be the biggest black hole that they have on the roster. The one thing for me, Payne, in watching that game, and I know we texted obviously throughout, I was surprised they stayed as committed to Derrick Henry as they did when you saw some of the bursts that Deontay Foreman had. It was the Titans offensive line creating holes, but Henry just wasn't able to show that wiggle, to show that acceleration that we'd grown accustomed to. And it's no fault of his own. I mean, the guy was playing with a plate in his foot. And I don't think anybody at the time of injury ever expected him to be back. But you do wonder, you know, maybe in the third quarter or late in that game going, hey, look, Derek, we know you want to play, but Foreman's going to give us a better chance to hit some of those home runs. It's not just that, right? When you look at the Bengals, and I know they were super motivated throughout the course of the week, we heard DJ Reader and his presser say something along the lines of, we heard you guys all week saying we couldn't stop the run. But if you look at certainly the opening few possessions, not only are eight guys in the box, but it looked like nine guys were in the box. They were selling out to stop the run, and we just did not get Todd Downing figuring out what the hell was going on. I mean, this is an Arthur Smith offense that again, the kind of creator of it, and we have his buddy, the leftover, Todd Downing, trying to replicate it, and it just was not the same this season. And then you're trying to work in new parts, and to your point, Trav- uh, Derrick Henry, a little bit too much. Foreman clearly had a little bit more burst. Foreman certainly looked like he was better positioned within that game. And you know, when you look at Derrick Henry, not just his ability to kind of dust off some of the rust after nearly eight weeks at least more than that right he left in the uh the Colts game week nine I believe was against the Rams that was his first official game missed off the top of my head and so he's been out since then you also look at the Bengals right so we have a a beat up running back or I shouldn't say beat up but one that isn't 100% going against a Bengals defense that was loading the box with eight plus defenders on over 55% of Derrick Henry's runs just running your head into a brick wall at that point even if you're a below average defense, you stick nine guys in the box against five offensive linemen, it's going to create some issues. And then certainly Ryan Tannehill did not play his best. And, you know, we'll get to that a little bit more because there are some things when we break down the Bengals defensive side of the ball against the Chiefs that will kind of go back to what they did against the Titans. But certainly that is one where you're feeling like, hey, you know, we we screwed up. Uh, a perfect situation where if we could have just gotten over the hump here we're now hosting uh, a playoff game against the Chiefs and we don't mind that matchup and so opportunity lost for sure Yeah, it's always tough. I mean, obviously much tougher to be a fan of a lot of these teams than it is to be a sports better. You can be unhappy about a bet that loses. Typically, you get over it in this business in five to ten minutes. Fans have to let it linger throughout the course of the offseason and wonder what could have been as far as some of their coaching decisions that were made, the player personnel, and what their prospects will look like going forward. Outstanding interview with John Sheeran uh, that we'll get to later in the show. Uh, But before we get into the games themselves, Payne, I did want to just get your quick take. A very busy Thursday morning you saw a couple of head coaching hires. Nathaniel Hackett made official in Denver. Matt Eberflus becomes the guy in Chicago taking over for Matt Nagy. Uh, when you look at this coaching carousel so far, are there certain hires that leave you brimming with confidence? Have there been a couple of hires that are extremely disappointing? Or do you think it's a discussion we should table and maybe revisit in anticipation of the Super Bowl 10 days from now once all the dust finally settles? Ultimately, I need a little bit more time with these. But first instinct with Nathaniel Hackett, understandable, right? Bring in an offensive mind. That's where you're lacking right now. You have the ties to LaFleur, who runs a very good offense. Prior to that, Nathaniel Hackett was part of the Jacksonville Jaguars run to the AFC Championship game with a guy named Blake Bortles. So he has managed a quarterback that certainly wasn't better once he left. And so you like the, that aspect of things. Let's see who he hires as a defensive coordinator. Let's see if that is partly Nathaniel Hackett, partly some inside scoop that, hey, this is where Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams might want to be next season. And so you can see where that package is certainly intriguing to the Denver Broncos, but we'll have to figure out that added portion of this hire a little bit later on. 
Who was the other hire for the Chicago Bears? Did you just say Matt Eberflus? <laughs> Tough sledding, boys. Tough sledding. Uh, <laughs> right. Oh. There's, there's some teams that, that do this better than others. Poor Bear fans. Um, they actually thought Brian Dable was going to go there, too, was the best part about some of uh, the buzz out of Chicago yeah, early he's, on. He's, yeah, he's staying on the staying on the East Coast. Um I don't like his defense to begin with. So it's it's very laid back, right? It is very soft coverage. So once you kind of step up in class, quarterbacks just pick you apart when you want to play your zone. I would say he was partly the weak link in Indianapolis, right? We know what Frank Reich is as a play caller, as an offensive mind. They certainly haven't hit the quarterback position out of the park, and that's been to their detriment. We know the special teams coordinator is from the school of Belichick, played for him, coached under him. We've seen some huge special teams plays come out of the Colts this season, whether it was in the game against New England. Also had another block punt for touchdown against Jacksonville, so we know the the special teams are short up in Indianapolis. The one question mark we had and the one thing we constantly said over the years was even though the Colts defense is grading out pretty well, it can be had. The secondary wasn't great. The constant off coverage wasn't great. The laid back approach to defense, not really sending blitz all that often while not having the best group and core of pass rushers left a lot to be desired. And we've gone on to see one of Matt Eberfuse's pupils and Jonathan Gannon, in my mind, struggle in year one as a DC with the Philadelphia Eagles. So I I don't like that hire at all. And not just from not liking his defense, but the idea of if Justin Fields is your guy, you got to bring in an offensive mind here. That's yeah. bar none. Now, I, it, it does concern me. Maybe I'm thinking about this too logically. Does that mean they're not sold on Justin Fields and they're going to approach the quarterback position in this draft? Like, if Justin Fields is your guy, you can't hire a defensive coordinator as your head coach. Can't do it. I mean, do it. that now means the most important hire that the Bears will make. I mean, you bring in a guy from Kansas City and Ryan Poles who knows what it takes to win there with a franchise quarterback. You now bring in a defensive-minded head coach and Matt Eberflus. Uh, the most important hire the Bears are going to have to make is figuring out who their OC is going to be. And to your point, I think that'll be pretty telling in terms of if he's got experience working with mobile quarterbacks or if it's a guy that comes from a true pro-style system, it may not be a harbinger of optimism for what the Bears believe they have in Justin Fields. And then having your DC to not just make the right hire an offensive coordinator, but to leave him the fuck alone <laughs> and not influence in-game decisions, right? And th- that's kind of the interesting part of this, right? And it just an example that comes to my mind because I'm a Shanahan guy and we're seeing it surface all week. But, you know, there's this clip now out there where Mike Pettin was the head coach of the Cleveland Browns at the time, defensive-minded guy. And... This is when Manziel's the quarterback, but I don't think he's actually playing. But there's a situation in late game where Mike Pettin's telling Mike uh, Kyle Shanahan what to run, and Kyle Shanahan's looking at him like, "You gotta be kidding me!" But he gives him a smirk, and Pettin's like, "I think we should run the ball here." And Kyle Shanahan just kind of looks at him, gives him a smirk, and then goes play action pass for a touchdown. And Pettin's like, "Good call, good call." <laughs> like, if you're hiring a defensive coordinator, you have to make sure that he is willing just to get out of the way especially when you have a young quarterback like Justin Fields. So the OC position becomes huge. But I keep coming back to this in the year 2021. The reason I like hiring offensive minds is that eventually, if your OC is the grand slam hire, he's going to be a head coach inside of two years. And now you're having to make the hire again. Which, allow, which which forces you to be perfect in your second OC hire, forces you to not have to like find a guy right you need to find a guy that runs a similar system so you're not wasting 18 months of Justin Fields in his prime learning a brand new offense and so those are always the struggles when you'd ultimately elect a higher defensive coordinator is that if he makes the most picture perfect hire as an OC that OC is gone inside of two years and then you got to do it all over again and be perfect once again 
it's so much goes into all the small decisions and obviously the domino effect that it has when you look at one hire, nothing stands alone in a vacuum and you try and identify the most successful franchises in terms of the mindset that they have, the approach to personnel and the way they handle their business. There's a reason that the good teams stay good and the bad teams continue to scuffle year in, year out. So for all those teams out there hoping for optimism and that hope springs eternal with some of the fresh faces you'll bring around your organization, it'll be very interesting interesting to see over the next couple weeks, especially leading up to the draft and how the anticipation builds for the start of next season. But there are four fan bases, Payne, that aren't worried about next year. They're very much focused on Sunday and trying to punch their ticket to Los Angeles to vie for the Lombardi Trophy. And the first game we have on Sunday at Arrowhead Stadium highlights the Kansas City Chiefs against the Cincinnati Bengals. And it's the Chiefs, a seven-point favorite at FanDuel Sportsbook. Total on the game sits at 54 and a half. Credit to the Bengals, first and foremost, going from six wins in the two years prior to a conference championship appearance, something that has never been done in the history of pro football. So Zach Taylor, whatever it took, uh, more power to Joe Burrow than anybody else. Uh, But clearly the Bengals, a lot of reason to be optimistic for their Cinderella story. Meanwhile, uh, this is a Kansas City Chiefs team, no stranger to getting to a conference championship game. Andy Reid in his fourth straight as head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, a feat that he accomplished in Philadelphia years ago at the turn of the 2000s with Donovan McNabb. We know these two teams did battle earlier this season. Again, the Cincinnati Bengals won outright a short home underdogs, 34-31. And Joe Burrow, to his credit this season, 5-0 straight up as a dog of three-plus points. Cincinnati has not found themselves as an underdog of this magnitude all season long. And since 1970, there have been seven touchdown underdogs to win their conference championship games. The Ravens were the team to do it most recently back in 2012. Payne, if the Bengals are going to be successful and play giant killer on Sunday, what kind of game plan do they need to employ? And more importantly, is this defense going to be up to the task? Score. Score some points. I mean, <laughs> that's really what this comes down that's to. That's why they pay him the, the big bucks around here, folks. <laughs> it, right. You kind of hit this perfectly, right? That this is this is awesome for Bengals fans. Like, what a ride, right? You're way ahead of schedule. You were pegged to be a six and a half win team. You've blown through that. This is as much as you could have hoped for. Joe Burrow, real deal, right? He's, he's, he's a true franchise quarterback, total baller. Right, not just the skill set, but you can tell his his vibe is a little different, right? He's got a good mindset. He's a stone cold killer. Like he's got ice in his veins. This is kind of what I was saying when people were like, first time quarterback in the playoffs. Like he's a different dude. But his betters, we have to separate end result from reality. And maybe Burrow's so good that he defies all the logic. But in round one, you got the Raiders. It's a below average football team. Only team worse to make the playoffs was Pittsburgh. Okay. Round two, you get the Titans, who you're familiar with, and I'll explain a little bit of that later, but Tennessee's the worst number one seed by our power rating since we started doing this at a very high level in 2004, okay? And again, like, awesome. You survived and advanced, and that's all that matters for fans and teams, right? Like, fist in the air, keep the dream alive. But, like, in those two wins, the Bengals' offense, which casual fans continue and to think is elite, along with the media, 39% success rate in the first two games of the playoffs. 24% of runs the last two weeks have graded successful. You were outgained by the Raiders by 0.4 yards per play. Titans outgained you by 1.4 yards per play. Cincinnati's a plus four in turnovers, right? They've, they've defied all the odds. I mean, you even look at some of these historic numbers in regards to the sacks they allowed. I mean, teams that have allowed seven sacks since 2002 have won just 12% of their games. It's a 213-game sample. The Bengals did that last week. But I just keep coming back to some of the That's not true, Payne. They didn't allow seven sacks. They allowed nine. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. At least seven sacks is is the the trend there. Now, this isn't going to surprise anybody, right? We've talked about these teams ad nauseum over the last like month these were the teams that were battling for playoff positions those were the key games that we broke down we've now broken them down multiple weeks in the playoffs but you keep coming back to Cincinnati at its core offensively being 18th in success rate on the season 18th in overall offensive efficiency despite facing the second easiest schedule of defenses nothing has really improved metrically 
And, you know, specific to this matchup, the way Spag's defense plays, which is man, lots of press, blitzing, that might allow the Bengals' weapons to be in position to win these one-on-one matchups. And that's exactly what happened in Week 17. Jamar Chase won those matchups, whether it was you know, the hope and heave jump balls or making plays after the catch. Bengals' offense had 264 yards of offense after the catch in Week 17 against the Chiefs. So the Chiefs have to be better tacklers in this game, especially when Cincinnati throws the quick short pass or the wide receiver screens. They have to be able to tackle Mixon in the flats when Burrow gets rid of it, when you know the inevitable pressure does hit. Those are parts of the field where they've struggled a little bit, right? They have young linebackers and, and Gay and Bolton, and sometimes you can beat them to the flat mentally. Um, now, Spags wasn't really aggressive last week against Buffalo. Coverage sat back some. Obviously, that makes sense when Tyron Matthew leaves after seven snaps and he's trotting out, you know, uh, Sneed as a safety rather than a corner. And he's got Daniel Sorensen back there. And Armani Watts, who was like on a practice squad a couple weeks ago, is, is getting starter snaps in the most critical junction of the season. So he only sent blitz 22% of the time last week. I would think with Tyron Matthew and Rashad Fenton both trending upwards, my feeling is we get back to normal with Spags and that he's going to want to put the offensive line of the Bengals in conflict. And I think it's really smart, even when Spags isn't going to actually send pressure to at least impact a young quarterback like Joe Burrow, who you know, seems to at this point struggle with some types of pressure right when you send like sim pressure basically you want to make a struggling offensive line and a rowdy ass place like arrowhead be forced to communicate so you're going to put five or six guys at the line but only send your natural four and if you look at sim pressure it's actually what gives the Bengals a line and offense the biggest trouble 41 percent pressure rate allowed when you show blitz and then back out of it you know you're going to want to use arrowhead to your advantage while also giving your secondary the best chance. And as great as Burrow is, there are times where, you know, he holds on to the ball. He's trying to hunt the big play. All of those nine sacks last week weren't on the offensive line, right? Like three or four of them were on Joe Burrow. And I think that's that's really interesting to think about on how you want to send pressure. Sure, like go willy-nilly a couple times and bring some heat. But I also think if you kind of just crowd the line of scrimmage, that can give the Bengals some trouble as well. If you look at the Bengals, They've lost 116 expected points on sacks this season. It leads the league by a long mile. It's not a metric you want to lead the league in. Chris Jones, Jerron Reed, they're going to have to win from the inside. We've outlined that all season when breaking down Bengals games. Melvin Ingram has been a saving grace for the Chiefs defense. He's got to dominate Isaiah Prince. You just kind of wonder here, like, if what the Bengals did last time can actually be replicated right if you go back and watch the game like yes there was a blown coverage in the second half by Daniel Sorensen but if you actually look at the corner play Chavarius Ward and Rashad Fenton were actually quite sticky in coverage they weren't just you know getting crushed here they they weren't right they were just struggling to make plays on the ball but if you look at T Higgins he only created 1.9 yards of separation that game Jamar Chase 2.8 yards of separation solid number not elite and just for context, like in week 17, Cooper Cup created 7.3 yards of separation. <laughs> so, like, the coverage was, aside from the Sorensen bust, was pretty sticky. They were just making out of the world type throws and catches. It was unbelievable. And then I sent you that clip, Todd, of the Bengals' second touchdown. It's, it's clear offensive pass interference by, Chess, uh, by, by Chase. He does, like, a really good job. Veteran savvy. Kind of like. Yes, kind of just, you know, nudging you off with the left and then creating some separation and catching it. And that's fine. I have no problem with that. Let them play. But you can't call the ticky-tack stuff on the Chiefs corners and then let the Bengals receivers play like it's a, you know, WWE-like style match, right? Like, you can't have that. The Chiefs were called for four penalties that extended drives in Week 17. 20 points came from those drive-extending penalties, including the game-winning field goal. When you look at penalty EPA... The Bengals were aided by penalties at one of the highest rates in a singular game all season. Bill Vinovich will be the lead official in this game. Now, the 
crews change a little bit. So even though he's the the lead official, it's not going to be like the same exact crew. They put all of like the best referees and ball them up into these crews. But which is, by the way, a dumb idea, and I still don't like it. I think you grade <laughs> you don't the, like the continuity thing. Exactly, you grade the crews yeah. on what you've seen during the regular season. There's chemistry, there's familiarity for officials. This isn't baseball where I can place a guy behind home plate and they're all operating on their own island. I'd rather maintain that continuity and just grade crews on what you've seen during the regular season. Yeah, that that makes complete sense. So, you know, his crew in general, Bill Vinovich, they have actually called one of the lowest rates of defensive pass interference. So you would think that's going to allow the Chiefs to play a little bit more physical with their corners. So, you know, my guess is since he isn't going to be aided at the rate they were in week 17, and, and, and that's scary because in my mind, for since he to have a chance at winning, right, this has to be a shootout. There has to be some variance with some turnovers because their defense ain't getting many stops here. No, they're by uh, all metrics going to have their hands full in this particular spot. And when you look at Cincinnati defensively, you know, they've played three elite quarterbacks so far this season, Payne, and all of those games for the Bengals came at home. Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs hung 31, albeit in a 34-31 loss. Justin Herbert and company came into the Bengals building, scored 41 points. They were aided by a defensive score, and Aaron Rodgers early in the year hung 25. So if you use elite quarterbacks in your own building as at least a floor, you figure Kansas City's getting to 28 minimum in this spot. And if they're pushed, they're going to have a much higher ceiling. You talked a little bit about Patrick Mahomes and how sharp he looked. And when we recap that Chiefs-Bills game, I mean, this is the kind of matchup where it's almost pick your poison. And Kansas City, for all the questions we had about their ability to dink and dunk their way down the field early on in the year, you've seen an emergence of some of those secondary weapons. It's not just Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey, who by all means were outstanding against Buffalo. 19 catches between them, 246 yards and two touchdowns. But Jarek McKinnon has come onto the scene. You saw the thunder and lightning approach with Clyde Edwards-Alaire, who finished with the second most rushing yards last week behind only Patrick Mahomes. And when you look at the receiving core, it's been a cast of characters. Mecole Hardman, not going to be considered an elite route runner anytime soon, but the Chiefs have at least figured out, hey, look, when this guy gets the ball in his hands, he can be dynamic, as we saw in the end around. Byron Pling- Pringle playing a bigger role. There are so many different ways the Chiefs can go about attacking you, and when I look at the Bengals, unless they're getting pressure with Trey Hendrickson and company up front, I mean, this is a stop unit that's going to be in conflict all night long. Oh, there's no doubt, and that's got to be the key. They somehow have to get some pressure, and they somehow have to turn Mahomes over two or three times. And I am just not as high on the Bengals defense, I think, as everyone else. And I I heard Dan Orvlosky call last week's defensive performance by Cincinnati from a schematic standpoint as the best of the weekend. I like Dan. He must have not made it to game two of the divisional round because (laughs) D'Amico Ryan's won that battle by a long mile. Um, And so, you know, for the last five days, I've, I've really heard people talk up Cincinnati's defense and... Man, I just I just don't see it. And specific to last week, and this is something I kind of wanted to hold uh, for this junction of the podcast rather than um, a top. Zach Taylor and Lou Anarumo had a built in advantage nobody talked about last week. I stayed quiet about it because sometimes it can be a little narrative street. I thought, <laughs> do you, do you want me to mention it <laughs> off the buy like? You know, Tennessee might have like a a few wrinkles, but we were wrong, right? And, you know, the built-in advantage was basically Zach Taylor was Ryan Tannehill's quarterback coach for four seasons in Miami. Yep. And Lou Anarumo, the Bengals' D.C., was in Miami as a defensive mind for six seasons when Tannehill was there. They know Ryan Tannehill's a jag. That's it. He's just another guy. Right. They, they know Ryan Tannehill had this 18-month stretch, so many deviations past like normalcy, that it would have to collapse at some point. And they knew how to rattle him. They knew what he liked to do, what he didn't like to do, that he holds on to the ball a touch longer than he should at times, that he stares receivers down, that he's not the most accurate, that sometimes he can't handle big moments. And if you are a Dolphins fan, you have seen Tannehill crumble when it matters most. And then you had... Todd Downing, who was just horrific. What he did during the bye week, I have no idea. 
But if you told me he went fly fishing, if you told me that he went on a cruise, I probably wouldn't argue with you because he was that bad. He was terrible. In saying all of that, <laughs> they still should have won the, the game. Averaged, yeah, the Titans averaged 6.8 yards per play. And if you knew what you were watching early and saw zero on the scoreboard for the Titans, you were thinking it's only a matter of time. Because if you actually watch some of those drives where like the ball is at the Cincinnati 39 in Blossom game with a stone cold drop in the flat doesn't happen, he's probably still running. And then you had the third down Tannehill miss to a wide open A.J. Brown on an in route that would have extended the drive. And then a possession later, Tannehill misses a wide open A.J. Brown down the right hash for a 60 yard touchdown. Like the list goes on and on for that game. Of, of missed opportunities, whether it's Tannehill missing a throw, whether it's a guy dropping a ball. So for me, it, it was the Titans not executing, not really what the Bengals did defensively. And, you know, we kind of talked about the Bengals defense for the last two weeks and how they just aren't that team. And nothing's really changed metrically again on this side of the ball. And, you know, over the last two weeks, we've kind of broken down the Bengals season into two parts And the second part of that season starts from week eight onwards. I mean, you're looking at a Bengals defense, 18th in EPA per play allowed, 24th in success rate allowed. And over that 13-week stretch, Cincinnati's faced three quarterbacks in the top 10 of EPA plus completion percentage above expectation. Lost two of those three games. Took a miracle to beat Mahomes in week 17. The rest of the quarterbacks in that sample, it's Mike White. It's Josh Johnson twice for two different teams. It's a beat-up Baker Mayfield. It's Drew Locke. It's Big Ben, who just retired this morning. It's Carr twice, and it's Case Keenum. This isn't a good defense, especially when you put it in the context of third most expensive D-line in the NFL, third most expensive secondary. And I go back and think about that Week 17 matchup. The Chiefs scored a touchdown on four straight drives in the first half. Tyreek had a monster drop well before halftime on this like 65 yard pass that would have set the Chiefs up around the Bengals 10 yard line they could have had more points in that game when you think about this and think about that specific situation Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill were battling back from COVID Clyde Edwards Hilaire did not play Jarek McKinnon wasn't a thing yet towards the final part of warm-ups starting left tackle Orlando Brown strained his calf did not play Lucas Niang, the Chiefs starting right tackle, tore his patellar tendon six snaps into the game. So down the right and left tackle, that forced the Chiefs to kick Joe Tooney to left tackle. You effectively downgraded three positions on the offensive line, on the fly, none of which you game planned for prior. And yet the Bengals only got to Mahomes on four of his 37 dropbacks. They made contact on just four of 37 dropbacks so that is the point that you kind of made at the top like Trey Henderson and those guys have to get after him they couldn't really do it with a makeshift offensive line and if you look at the last seven games the Chiefs offense has really come alive number one in EPA per play Patrick Mahomes right no surprise is is responsible for that he's leading the charge he's number one in EPA plus completion percentage above expectation over this seven game run he seemed to kind of mature in a major way especially the last two weeks again just kind of taking what defenses are giving him not a single turnover worthy throw in the playoffs yet this just kind of feels like the Chiefs are getting to 34 plus here I don't see the Chiefs sitting on it either knowing they blew a 14 point lead to the Bengals a couple weeks ago and you know for for transparency's sake like we hit over 30 and a half on the Chiefs team total earlier this week and if you have access to Pinnacle probably a, a damn good bet still guys i respect laid the chiefs at open minus six and a half at seven it's a debate but i can tell you right before we started recording this podcast there was another wave on the chiefs and now we're out to like seven minus 20 on this game so i think what's always interesting todd in these big games and i'm kind of just referencing social media all of the guys that are kind of going to try to choose my words carefully here creating content (laughs) that don't necessarily do this they want to feel sharp we're just going to gravitate towards the dog and that just isn't how real professional bettors wagering large sums of money operate it's not always just like dog or pass we're not always just taking the dog 
And in this instance, right, it was Chiefs minus six and a half at open. And now that limits are starting to rise on a Thursday, we're seeing that second wave on the Chiefs. And if you are someone that is in this space and you know the specific betters and groups and where they bet, Mirage has been hanging out at seven and a half all week. Um, and I think if you're in this space, you know the better that bets there. Um, so interesting to think about it that way. Yeah, I'm also always curious when you look at games like this, when uh, seven and a half ultimately becomes the prevailing number, if you see a little bit of an appetite for the underdog as well in this spot or that next move would potentially come from. So clearly with two games on the board, higher volume. And uh, I, I think people, and we can kind of tip our hand a little bit, will be fascinated by one of the questions that you asked John that we'll get to in the interview much later in the show. That'll be a little bit of an eye-opening experience and why this podcast is so much more valuable than most of the content out there. And we have a chance to talk Talk to the folks making those decisions behind the counter and some of the thought process that goes into creating numbers, especially in games like this, where the bookmaker's primary job is to get handle, 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 because the power of 11 to 10 can't be outrun by recreational bettors and even professionals to a lesser extent this time of year. When we get to the second game, Payne, in the NFC, a trilogy of sorts, but it's been a one-sided rivalry between the 49ers and Rams. This will be the first intra-division conference championship game we've had since 2013. I know all the narrative out there is it's hard to beat a team three times. That couldn't be further from the truth. The team that wins the first two meetings typically goes on to win the third meeting. We saw Sean McVay's air of invincibility uh, kind of take a blow in week 18. He was 45-0 and in leading at halftime before the 49ers came barnstorming back down 17-3. to And also, McVay probably not keeping the best company if he were to lose this game on Sunday when you consider the last head coach to lose to another head coach seven times in a row. Marvin Lewis against Mike Tomlin, and we know where Marvin Lewis is at this point in his career, looking to try and revive an HBCU this upcoming season. San Francisco, a win here would mean their eighth appearance in the Super Bowl would move them into tie. Touchy subject there, Todd. Touchy subject. Well, I mean, clearly, given the comments we heard from Shaq, Deion Sanders won't be long for the HBCUs either, because he should be at the top of the list to be the next head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Oof. That's so, tough. Tough so, sled there. Uh, Shaq's got to stick to uh, peddling companies, not so much hiring football coaches. Very good, very good brand guy. I mean, he's got a hell of a team, but hell of a team behind him. But I do have to wonder. I mean, Shaq at the end of the day, you think he's taking home fifty cents on the dollar for all the products he's promoting? Yes. Yeah, he's certainly got a team behind him that's that's pumping that out. Um, not to go too far off the rails, but. Um, Mike McCarthy, Super Bowl or bust before Sean Payton overtakes his oh, office. Hundred percent. Twenty. Okay. Hundred percent. And if if you're the Cowboys, you're already figuring out what that compensation package is going to look like because I think Payton's deal technically expires at the end of the 2024 season. And I'll go one step further. If I'm the Saints, I'm trying to figure out how I can offload all of my veterans right now to get assets in return because this is a rebuild given their cap situation that ain't waving a magic wand to try and making this team relevant again. All we can hope is that we don't start to see brown paper bags back in the Superdome over the next two or three seasons. I don't know if it's the right hire, but I think Dennis Allen is deserving of the job. I would give him a two years, right? Just kind of knowing what our issues were and him coming in and completely changing the defense and the culture of our team and getting us to multiple Super Bowl runs. It felt like Dennis Allen was really integral, and I would probably be forced to giving him a chance. And I'm not giving him a long leash, but I'd probably hire him on like a two-year guarantee just to kind of take things over and obviously, as you alluded to, kind of manage the shit show that is the salary cap. And if he can somehow come out the other side of that, that he's certainly deserving. If not, then we've uh, positioned ourselves a little bit better for who we'll hire two or three years from now. Also, a quick correction, by the way. I said Marvin Lewis was at an HBCU. That's wrong. It's Hugh Jackson that took over at Grambling. Marvin Lewis is part of the fiasco that's ongoing at Arizona State, so I'm not sure that is better or worse in the grand scheme of things. When you look at this 49ers team, though, one thing about them is Jimmy Garoppolo has been a consummate overperformer as far as when he's thrust into the underdog role. And it's not necessarily because of what he's done on the football field. But Payne, when we look at the way this Rams 49ers series has gone, 
It's a lot more than, hey, look, the Rams are going to play with an extra chip on their shoulder trying to get revenge. You don't lose six times in a row to the same team because of chance. Now, four of those meetings didn't include Matthew Stafford, but it didn't matter. Jared Goff to Matthew Stafford, Kyle Shanahan has been one step ahead. What has made the 49ers so successful in these matchups between two of the best young coaches in the National Football League? I think that's the right question, you know, because everyone's going to hear all week and they'll continue hearing until kickoff about this dominance of Shanahan over McVay. And obviously for good reason, right? You mentioned he's one six straight and you have to bring it up and you have to talk about it. But I think finding out why it's happening is actually the important thing. And, and no doubt, right? It's, it's Shanahan's system. So he's going to know it better than the guy he taught in McVay. And when you know the core of the system, you're going to be more adept at tweaking it you're going to know how others plan to stop it. So you're already going to have the the counter move to the adjustments ready and waiting. And in Shanahan's case, like it's it's multiple counters and he makes things look like something and poof, it's it's totally different. But this isn't just a coaching thing. You know, a lot of its scheme, some of its personnel, some of it's how the teams are obviously built. And obviously there's a ton of overlap between those things. I don't know which would be more important of that kind of trio but if you're just speaking offensively the 49ers are a run first team even when Jimmy G throws it it's based on a concept off the run the vast majority of the time well the Rams defense was built by Brandon Staley and it's been maintained by Raheem Morris but that defense is a new age style of defense that's how it's built we're going to give up the run that's not as efficient We're built to stop passing attacks with pressure. We're going to play with light boxes. We're going to dedicate more guys uh, to the secondary with our defensive backs and coverage, right? Like, so the first element to this and the 49ers' success is they play with heavy offensive formations at a top five rate in the league. 36% of snaps this season, San Fran's trotted out both a tight end and a fullback, okay? Meanwhile, the Rams' defense plays with the lightest box in the entire league they play with light boxes at the highest rate okay and then you couple that with the fact that von miller and leonard floyd are lighter rangier defensive ends so we've seen the 49ers be able to muscle their way around this side of the ball the second thing that we love our offensive minds to do and something we talk about all the time is use lots of motion and use lots of play action Kyle Shannon has always used motion at like one of the league's very highest rates. And basically what motion does is force a defense to tip its hand pre-snap. It helps identify coverages. It helps identify blitzers. Well, the Rams defense does a fantastic job disguising their coverages. And when you play with a light, fast defense with sometimes five guys in coverage, you can hide things. So according to true media, the Rams disguise their defensive coverage at the highest rate in the NFL meaning what they show pre-snap changes post-snap. Only 53.5% of the time does the coverage the Rams show pre-snap end up being their exact coverage. Well, because of the high rates of motion the 49ers use, it forces the Rams to tip their hand coverage-wise more than they would like pre-snap. The other thing here within coverage is because of all the motion the 49ers use, Shanahan's smart enough to try and remove Jalen Ramsey from the game a little bit, especially if he's going to shadow Debo. So we can remove the best coverage guy from the equation if we motion Debo out and then use Kittle and Ayuk on the opposite side of the field or over the middle. And that latter part is something we've focused on breaking down involving the Rams defense all season, right? They're susceptible over the middle. They lost Johnson in the offseason to the Browns. The Rams devalue the linebacker position. Troy Reader is a real liability, right? And the entire 49ers offense is about valuing tight ends and fullbacks and running backs and all the motion and play action. That stuff is designed to put linebackers and safeties in conflict. So it's this double-edged sword where the Rams are weakest over the middle. That's exactly where Jimmy G is the best throwing it. And that is also why, you know, Shanahan has had some success on the offensive side of the ball. It's it's everything. It's matchup. It's play calling. It's design. It's it's uh, player personnel. Everything gives the 49ers offense a little bit of an advantage here. Now, can that get zapped, right? Can suddenly you come out in a one game sample and stuff the run? You're going to dedicate more guys to the box. Your defensive ends are going to play like monsters and hold up to, to Kittle and to use check 
when they pull, right? When you get a, a, a tackle pulling, can Von Miller hold up to that tackle and pulling? I, I don't know. But on a one-game sample, maybe he mans up. Maybe those guys man up. I just, I think it's very difficult schematically for the Rams, the way they're built to have true success on this side of the ball. You know, to your point too, and you look at some of the numbers and early downs and score neutral situations, the 49ers have run the ball at a league high rate of a shade more than 57%. In the two games against the Rams, that number has gone even higher. And it's crazy to think about week 18, knowing that the 49ers found themselves down 17 points in that game. They ran the ball more than 73% of the time on early downs. And I think it speaks to the personnel that the Rams don't have as far as the linebackers, you know, Kyle Shanahan looking to get an extra hat on hat and taking advantage of the guys like Debo Samuel, a guy like Elijah Mitchell, who hasn't been ultra efficient so far this playoffs, but suddenly the 49ers are also getting much healthier at the running back spot that you could see a little bit more Jeff Wilson and a combination in a cast of characters looking to go about trying to take advantage of that. One of the other things when you look at the 49ers pain, they're not a team that likes to blitz a ton, and that actually plays into their hands when you go up against a quarterback like Matthew Stafford, who's been one of the best in the league in terms of dealing with the blitz. But when you don't blitz him, Stafford's numbers don't blow anybody away. Are there things the Rams can do to change their offensive attack plan against a 49ers defense that we know has some question marks in the secondary, but to D'Amico Ryan's credit, they did an outstanding job trying to neutralize Devontae Adam for stretches last week, and they've been able to mask some of their deficiencies as they're getting healthier on that side of the ball with Emmanuel Mosley in the fold and expectations are that even a guy that's a second rate defensive back in Ambry Thomas should be available for Sunday's contest going to be very difficult right what's what's your counter and right now the 49ers defensive line is playing out of their minds it's on a another level it's not only just getting to the quarterback it's stuffing the run they are just killing people at the line of scrimmage and I think we mentioned this a couple weeks back about how their defensive line was trending and how it was like number two in EPA per rush allowed the back half of the season and you look at the run offenses that they've faced the last handful of weeks they're all really good run offenses and they've stuffed those out as well the Rams like to run the ball have not been efficient at all force feeding Cam Akers a little bit too much and so you don't see a situation where the Rams are going to be able to run the ball effectively here. And the matchup advantages that we just discussed don't really end on the offensive side of the ball for the 49ers. And you kind of hinted at the top there, one of those matchup advantages that the 49ers do have on this side of the ball as well. And it's something that we've kind of chronicled about Matthew Stafford as anytime we talk about the Rams, really. And Tampa Bay didn't listen. Todd Bowles decided to be who he was and not adapt to opponent last week. He sent blitz at a 39% rate against Matthew Stafford and got absolutely toasted, including the game winner to Cup. And if you just look at Stafford's numbers, 15 to 1 touchdown to interception ratio when blitzed. His adjusted completion percentage is higher when blitzed than when he throws from a perfectly clean pocket. The Rams rank first by a sizable margin and expected points added per play versus blitz. The 49ers defense, though, they only blitz 19% of the time. It's the fourth lowest rate in the league. D'Amico Ryan sent blitz 14% of the time last week against Aaron Rodgers. In the Week 18 matchup, that game turned on a dime in the second half because the 49ers pressured Stafford on 58% of his dropbacks. Most of that was natural pressure, and that's where Stafford's production really falls off a cliff. And, you know, again, the 49ers defensive line just nutty good right now. Some of the backups that are getting rotational snaps, 10, 12, 14, again, they're bringing pressure. The other matchup advantage on this side of the ball is Matthew Stafford has been a different quarterback when going against man coverage versus zone coverage. And if you look at this season alone, when Matthew Stafford goes against man coverage, he's a total animal plus 0.2 EPA per attempt, nearly 10 yards per pass attempt, 69% completions, 19 to 2 touchdown to interception ratio, and a 134 rating. But again, zone, 15 touchdowns, 14 picks. Stafford's yards per attempt dip 1.7 yards per attempt. Passer rating plummets 42 points. And why that's important 
is the 49ers live in zone coverage. Virtually their entire makeup as a coverage unit is predicated on zone coverage. So again, all week you're going to hear about Shanahan owning McVay. Todd and I thought it was better to kind of break this game down and tell you why it's happening and not just saying it's happening. And it's really these matchup advantages on both sides of the ball. And the reason, right, we've kind of mentioned this all season, but the reason why a lot of the professional betters, and not just specific to this game, but also in this game, are gravitating a little bit towards the 49ers is their market price. And it feels like, and we've done some studies on this and maybe we'll divulge it a little bit later, but we know quarterback's the most important position on the field by a long mile. It's the most valuable by a long mile. So if you can identify discrepancies and what you think quarterbacks are versus perception and market, you're going to get a nice little head start on finding value in the market. And the reason why professional betters keep gravitating to the 49ers is the market and casual fans and the media think Jimmy G is horrific. And certainly there's a wide range in variance to his game. And last week, only getting, what, three points on the bookend possessions to end the half and to start the second half against the Packers was criminal. And certainly the referees played a little bit of a role in that. This isn't the type of offense that can overcome second and long, third and long. And so, you know, when you got the hold on Trent Williams and then you got the face mask on Elijah Mitchell, that set those guys back and it put Jimmy G in second and long and he threw the pick. But what is interesting is, and why there's a little bit of a battle on this game, it's that Jimmy G variance, right? One thought process is he can't play worse then he's played the last five quarters and yet the 49ers are here what if you get a good jimmy g performance what does that mean for them and you would expect a better performance here right when you think about one he's his thumb is healthier now than it was when these teams played the very first time if you remember he didn't shoot up the finger in the first half the first time these guys played shot it up in the second half he was a different quarterback number two he's not playing in negative four degree weather here he's in a dome He's in warm weather. We watched last week. He started taking snaps under center, which told us the thumb was a little bit healthier. He even whipped off the tape before the game. Said, get rid of the tape. I don't need it. So I think we're going to see a little bit better of a Jimmy G performance than what you're hearing of being, what, uh, zero touchdowns, four interceptions in in the postseason so far. I think you're going to get a better Jimmy G effort here. Oh, I got numbers on that for you, just to uh, make sure that people don't think we're purely one-way traffic on Jimmy G and apologists. Jimmy G, in his career, when throwing zero touchdown passes, pain nine and two. He's three and zero oh in the playoffs in games where he doesn't throw a touchdown pass. In his four career playoff wins, Jimmy Garoppolo has seventy-one career pass attempts. You don't have to be a math wizard to figure that out, that it's less than 20 attempts per game. So clearly there is a method to the madness. Jimmy can make throws when needed to, but Kyle Shanahan realizes play to your strengths, understand how to set your quarterback up for success, hit the big play to George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, get Debo Samuel his touches, and there are plenty of other ways to win football games rather than letting your quarterback air it out 40 to 50 times. I think the other interesting element here, and it requires a little bit of reading, watching some post-game pressers, watching some of these coaches speak. If you look on the season, the 49ers are 26th in special teams efficiency, have not been good. Obviously created the massive play that assisted in the win last week against Green Bay. And immediately what Shanahan said after the game is, we know how important these games are now. We're starting to play a couple of our starters on special teams. And this is something we're going to look at in the offseason, and maybe we improve our special teams by getting more starters out there. And so that's an interesting element here. It's something that a lot of people don't think about. And when you look at, again, if you are looking at the efficiency numbers, you're going to be like, oh, San Francisco's 26th in efficiency, not a very good special teams. Well, all of a sudden, they're starting to implement some of these starters in there. So you're getting a boost in that element of their game as well. Yeah, it's crazy to think about. Obviously, there's a ton of narratives with only two games going on on Sunday. People have combed over these games, but it's figuring out where you can identify an edge, even if it's a small one based on player perception and some of what we've seen versus what may unfold on Sunday. Two great games that we can only hope live up to a fraction of the entertainment value of what we saw in the divisional round, both on Saturday and Sunday. We do have one order of business to transact, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, We 
teased the interview with John Shear, and I think it's a perfect time to bring him into the mix. He joins us every Thursday here on the Bet the Board podcast. You, of course, can follow John Shear and on Twitter. That's at J Shear and J S H E E R A N one nine eight one. And John. I know you're a little bit sad knowing that you only get to do this today and then one more time before they hand out the Lombardi Trophy because this is the most exciting thing you do during the course of football season is join Payne and I every Thursday, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, my Thursdays are going to be filled with aimless wandering around the streets trying to figure out like, how I can <laughs> fill an hour on a, on a Thursday morning in the summer. So, uh, yeah. Well, we, we appreciate that. It means the world to us. But uh, as we always do, we get you on. Wanted to just kind of put a bow on what we saw last weekend. Safe to imagine that you guys had a pretty good day on Saturday with both underdogs winning outright in the form of the Bengals against the Titans and the 49ers going into Green Bay and winning that one. Meanwhile, Sunday have to, I would assume, and don't want to put words in your mouth, that a pretty balanced book didn't put you guys in a great spot one way or another for Sunday's results. Yeah, spot on. Um, it was exactly like you say, um, particularly the Niners being an excellent result for us. We you know, tried to inflate our exposure on the Packers as much as we possibly could uh, all week long. Uh, uh, so that was an excellent result for us, uh, both on the day and, and looking ahead to the future, um, the outright book as well. Uh, Sunday, less so. Obviously, we were really saved by the fact that all the Bills' offense went through um, Gabriel Davis, and, and without that would have been in a world of pain with um, Mahomes, Allen, Tyreek Hill, and Kelsey all going over inside two minutes, uh, <laughs> as well as all the scores that they got. That would have uh, really killed us. So we actually ended up making a profit on product like same game parlay on the Chiefs game, but had been pretty badly hurt by it uh, earlier for the Bucks and Rams. So uh, all in all, we'll take it, and we've built a, a really good slate, I think, for the uh, the two games this weekend. Yeah, I have to imagine that most folks out there weren't tying the same game parlays into Stefan Diggs going under with his three receptions for seven <laughs> yards or anticipating that Gabriel Davis to score three or more touchdowns was a key leg as far as anybody trying to build that stuff out. Uh, I'll let Payne ask about the games this weekend, but just kind of wanted to pick your brain a bit, John. You guys have been great about putting out some of the look-ahead numbers. First to market before the games get played. We see all the potential permutations for Super Bowl matchups. Can you walk through uh, the process for some of our listeners out there that may not be that familiar? We know it's a baseline power number, but how much you guys will do in the way of adjustments based on the results we see for Sunday in terms of coming to market with a little bit more of a concrete price once we know the two combatants in Los Angeles? Uh, yeah, look, I think, like you said, that they're pretty much based off the core ratings with an adjustment for what has to happen for that matchup to happen. So, for example, the Bengals and the Niners right now show a two and a half points uh, favoritism for San Francisco. And that might look um, pretty um, fair and definitely does to me. Um, but by that time, the Bengals would have had to overcome the Chiefs. So presumably get would get an upgrade uh, in their rating for that. Admittedly, the Niners have come through in Los Angeles, but I'm not sure that would move their rating a whole lot. For for us, they're almost equal teams already, and you know uh, they're not the sort of team to explode on you and beat you through the air for uh, for 28 points or anything like that. So they would get a, a small adjustment, but I think the Bengals would get a greater one. Uh, so I think it's just that situational stuff on top of the, the, the core numbers at the, at, at the base, effectively. John, we'll get to Bengals Chiefs here in a minute, but you said something really interesting off air in terms of how you guys planned on booking this weekend, some insights into your numbers. But you said something along the lines of for a weekend like this, you might not pay as much attention to some of the sharp action you see. What do you mean by that? Uh, I just mean that at this stage of the season, with everybody healthy, COVID has now gone away in the NFL. Um, <laughs> we we should have you know high levels of confidence around our numbers and be willing to back it at this stage of the season. You know we do that throughout the regular season when there are far more unknowns, particularly given the last two years that we've had. I think we now get to a situation where you know we know what what these teams are about. We've had a full season of play underneath them, and I think we are. You know, less likely to move even off our sharper betters uh, than we would be at any other stage of the season. I think you know you learn something from the bets that come in early in the week, even at this stage, and even on the Super Bowl. Um, but we are far less likely to be aggressive in our in our moves uh, while respecting that information than I guess we would at any other stage of the season. 
makes complete sense. And when we look at Bengals Chiefs, that did open some shops below a touchdown. We saw that shoot out to seven this morning. A little bit more money on the Chiefs. I would say we're at about 7.2 right now. Have you guys seen any sharp money on the Chiefs to this point? No, we opened at six and a half, and I think we were at six and a half for a lot of the week uh, before moving to seven. Oh, no, we actually moved it quite quickly a- afterwards to seven. I think we laid a sharp bet uh, at that stage at six and a half to get us to seven. Uh, haven't really seen a ton of action. Definitely a strong bias towards the Chiefs, as you would expect, particularly off you know the offensive performance that they generated. And I think even though the Bengals won, I don't think that, you know at least at the outside looking in, they were that visually impressive. So... Uh, all the narrative players, all the public betters are back again uh, on the Chiefs and expect that to be the way it goes for the rest of the week. Yep, Chiefs scoring 40 points in back-to-back games. The Bengals outgained by both the Raiders and the Titans. So interesting to see there. Anything from a totals perspective on that game? We did see it open a shade lower at 53.5, now out to 54.5. A A couple shops did go to 55, but saw immediate resistance from some of the uh, model players, we'll call yeah, I think, like you said, this game feels very much like the Chiefs and, and the Bills from last week. Our number is only 53 again. Uh, but again, I think, you know, you touched on it really well last week around why that is. And this game feels the exact same. I see both offenses having a ton of success again. I think the Bengals are less likely to build sustainable drives like the Bills did. So I see more possessions in the game. Uh, and yeah, I think the way these defenses play, the, how aggressive the offenses are, obviously have more confidence in the Chiefs given... Uh, the spread, but at the same time, I think the Bengals can have success offensively. So it didn't surprise me to to see it jump from where we opened it. I think at fifty three and a half uh, out to the fifty four and a half, but I I don't see it getting any higher. It didn't get any higher last week, and I don't know why it would here. It makes complete sense. And when we transition to the evening game, Forty Niners Rams, third time they'll face. This season, we'll hear all week about Shanahan having McVeigh's number. Obviously, finding out why is always important. I know you guys in-house have been a little bit higher on the 49ers. What is that number for you guys this week? And uh, did you kind of maybe go off market uh, in terms of your price compared to where we currently sit now? Uh, no, I'm, we opened this at three and a half on the look ahead actually uh, two weeks ago. So uh, we're still at that exact same number right now. So really haven't seen a whole lot of movement in it. Uh, I think some of the injuries, Trent Williams, obviously, and then, you know, we know the both are potentially a little bit more banged up than we've heard. Obviously concerns around Garoppolo and Fred Warner to some degree. Expect them all to play. Uh, but that's enough for us to sit at three and a half. Uh, our core number is actually, you know, three or even a touch below it. Uh, as you said, we've been high on the Niners all season. I think this is the week where we kind of get off that train of being aggressive with them. I don't see it really moving from three and a half. We've seen sharp play. Um, two of our three sharpest customers are on opposite sides at three and a half here, one on the minus and one on the plus. So I think that's good indication for us that this game really probably shouldn't close anywhere else bar three and a half, and we're fine with that. Makes complete sense. It is interesting to to hear the the one group or better laid three and a half because you know early on in the week we did see some 49ers money come in when you could get four and even some three and a half and we saw this get down to as low as as three it was pretty much a consensus 3.2 so that is pretty uh telling if they are willing to lay three and a half in terms of the total opened as high as 47 that is a key number now down to 45 and a half at FanDuel obviously some sharp money there is did that all come at one time or was there multiple wax at that total under yeah the same account uh, three and a half and uh, under 46 and a half where we were at the time down to 45 and a half right now our number is a little higher but I think you've seen what San Francisco are all about and when they have success offensively and are able to run the ball less possessions obviously so you know I, I can see um you know why we've taken money on the under in the game but yeah cer- certainly the same account uh, twice very quickly together on both of those sides john one last thing before we let you go uh obviously excited to see what will unfold on sunday of the four teams that are remaining any liability existing for you guys in terms of big picture whether it's long shot tickets on the 49ers as their prices drifted out uh, i know some of the books out my way said that they took some money on the Bengals early, not to the point that they're worried about it, but I know obviously when you talk about a team opening in that 150 to 200 range, you know, 10 and $15 tickets can add up quickly, but I can't imagine the Bengals are a very popular team in a lot of the states where FanDuel does majority of their business. 
Uh, no, they haven't been. You're, you're exactly right. I think the biggest win for us certainly is San Francisco. We've been high on them all season long, probably even a little too high on them at a certain stage. You know, their money There's no line. such thing as being too <laughs> high on the Niners, John. Let that be known. This is the Jimmy Garoppolo Fan Club Podcast along with Stetson Bennett. We have to represent guys that nobody else wants a part of uh, early in the season. So, look, uh, we have one loser left in the future, um, and that is the Rams. Um, You know, the the Chiefs are a a decent winner for us, a couple of million dollars, and it grows from there on to Cincinnati, uh, less so, and then the Niners being uh, the best result that we have left. I think that just reflects, like I said, the opinion we've had all season of them being underrated uh, through the entirety of the season, and even at 5-1 to right now, not really seeing a whole lot of action. I think there's other shops out there with bigger numbers, so people are happy to go to the go to those books and, and take that price on the Niners, and uh, we're pretty happy for them to do that too. Should be an outstanding weekend of action as we're down to three meaningful football games before they hand out the Lombardi Trophy two weeks from Sunday. Can't thank you enough for all your contributions, not only on this show, John, but of course throughout the season. We'll look forward to talking to you. When all of those Super Bowl props have been hung, the markets have been set, and we'll know the two teams that are playing for the Lombardi Trophy. Look forward to it. Thank you guys for having me on all season. I'm sure I'll find something to do on a Thursday morning. You know, Payne, we talk about having John on, and it's always great to get his perspective, but I found you know, a couple of his comments today even more profound than what he normally adds, which is a layer of depth and complexity that we can't bring just ourselves, talking about how they almost devalue sharp action this week because you trust your number so much and there's such a high handle number that you're not going to make wild fluctuations based on just one sharp bet. I agree with that, right? This time of year, you should have your numbers pretty well molded. There's also benefit that they're both around key numbers. So you can't make these large sweeping moves in my mind. And again, we saw early on in the week, we saw massive money come in from the Chiefs in terms of who liked it. Typically, that would move the line a little bit more than it did. And then this morning, once limits rose, we saw another wave come in on the Chiefs. Typically, that would move the line substantially more than it has, where we're looking at 7 minus 15, 7 minus 20. So to John's point, I think in a typical week where you're not going to have as much volume, if you get smacked once at six and a half and once at seven, when the limits rise, your next move is immediately to seven and a half. And maybe you're even taking it into that that eight and a half, nine range to protect some teaser liability, watching groups pummel you that way as well. We haven't seen that to John's point. So he was spot on being on accurate there. And I thought it was a good question to ask him. And ultimately, right, we we have John on because one, we, we really like him. And two, the element of having a sports book guy in the podcast and giving you guys a little bit different of a voice is impactful. But the reason why I love John coming on is not only can he talk the book side, but we know he bets games and we know he has an opinion and we know he can actually talk about the games. And that is an element that most odds makers don't have. So it's good to see John get some love from some other people in the space. I know his uh, his phone lines have been blowing up since joining Bet the Board. Yeah, I was going to say, you and I may have to try and take on the role of publicist to handle some of his media obligations going forward, uh, given he is a man in high demand. But you love to see it. Good things happen to good people, especially those with great information in a space that continues to get flooded with, well, we can keep that discussion for a different day. All right, my friend, it's come to that time of the show where we've broken down the games as in-depth as we know how to around these parts, but to keep that hot streak intact, where are we sending our listeners to the window this weekend? So I think, you know, this is this is kind of interesting because you've listened to us break down both games. We certainly have a lean and opinion on both games, but there is a little bit of a battle going on here, as I insinuated, on 49ers Rams. So we did have a very sharp group come out, buy some 49ers at plus four. This did get down to three, where I saw another group come in and jam the, the Rams minus three. We're now out to three and a half. And as John just mentioned, the two sharpest players at his shop, one laid three and a half, one took three and a half. And I think it comes down to this Jimmy G variance that we were just kind of talking about. If you're looking at that game and saying, hey, they've won in spite of this, the luck's going to end, 
then you're looking at the Rams. If you're saying, hey, they won in spite of this, if he can just play to an average level, the 49ers are probably going to win the whole thing, right? There's two different mindsets, and that's why we're having the battle at three and a half. At this point, I need a little bit more information before I decide to tie my money up at minus 110 and get involved in a coin flip battle between the guys that I know are on both sides of this game. And let's just go to the game that we did bet earlier this week. There is some of that value lost, but FanDuel currently dealing over 31 minus 15 on the Chiefs team total. If you shop, you can still get 30 and a half minus 25 and minus 30 some places. So we'll call it a consensus 31. We'll go over the Chiefs total of 31 as the best bet this week, Todd. Man, time flies when you're having fun. We talked about it early in the year and we started to do all our divisional previews in August. We weren't sure what the dynamics were going to mean as far as producing content with the addition uh, of an extra week of the regular season. But as the sand continues to go through the hourglass, uh, you appreciate all the hours that go into it. It's been a successful season and one that will hope to continue some of that momentum on Sunday. I know we have one final show left for the Super Bowl. We'll, of course, share those announcements on social media in terms of when that'll be available. Of course, I've done a shit job again today of reminding people to follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there again. Most importantly, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And as always, FanDuel.com. Use the promo code Bet the Board, whether you're in the state of New York, West Virginia, Arizona, or soon to be live in Louisiana. Take advantage of everything FanDuel has to offer from their risk-free bets to the enhanced odds. It's the perfect time of year going into championship weekend with the Super Bowl sitting on the horizon. Want to thank all of you, our loyal listeners, for the continued support, the loyalty, the comments, the feedback, the interaction. You guys are the reason that we have so much fun doing this each and every week throughout the season special thanks as always to john for taking time out of his busy day to provide that perspective from behind the counter and Payne, anything uh wisdom wise that you'd like to impart on our listeners before we take a little bit of a longer break with before it's the deep dive time with the uh super bowl that's everything let's have patrick mahomes lead us to the promised land for the second week in a row Let's get more than 31 points. Points of plenty with the Kansas City Chiefs on Sunday. And so with a KC team total ticket over the total in hand, we'll see you at the window.